Michael Fennessy writes intensely expressive music that reimagines the limits of instrumental technique. Many of his works are recompositions of familiar source materials that emerge profoundly transformed in surprising ways. In this wide-ranging interview, we covered his compositional process, why he feels like an outsider, how he works with harmony, and much more. I also asked him some questions that were submitted via Patreon. If you want to join us, click the Patreon link in the video description, and remember to hit like and subscribe so you won't miss another video. Thanks for watching. You're listening to the Samuel Andreev podcast. My guest today is the composer and pianist Michael Finnessy. Michael needs no introduction, least of all from me, so we're just going to get right into the discussion. Michael, one of the things I really wanted to ask you about is, given the immense scope of your productivity, the scope of your activities, not only as a composer and as a pianist, I'm really curious as to how composition fits into your life exactly. One of the things I'm most curious about is, do you start with the idea, with the expressive impetus, or do you start simply with the desire to work and the ideas follow? How does that process work? Hard to say. I feel a need to write regularly, but I, I respond best when I've had an invitation to write something. And that comes with various specifics. It might be a performer who wants a piece. Less often, it might be an ensemble. It, it depends. And that usually fires me up in some kind of way. I then go and do a certain amount of research. I'm thinking all the while. I rely on my subconscious to remain active, even when my conscious mind isn't. Well, what do you mean by research exactly? What, so what does that stage of the process look like? Um, well, it depends, on the, it, it depends on the request, and it depends on the nature of the task. For me, composition is a form of exploration. It's a sort of investigative process into both sound. I use pitched sounds for the most part, sometimes untuned percussion, but mostly pitches. I'm very excited by pitches still. So I'm thinking about that. Um, there might be um, other things that are crossing my mind, structural issues which I want to grapple with. It's really hard to say because there isn't a consistent pattern and I don't I don't really have dogmatic views about the composition of music. Um, it's it, it's all a, it's all an investigation of a, a journey of some sort. But there's a process of material gathering, at any rate, that you start with, and that can look like different things, I imagine, depending on the project. Yes, I mean, I, I sketch or jot down things on paper as I go along. I have a sketchbook. Um, and I make notes, make notes of particular pitch combinations that appeal to me, particular rhythmic ideas which appeal to me. Again, there's no general, there's no general pattern for it. It does depend a lot on circumstances, I think. But is there a sense in which you have to retool with new pieces? I mean, there are composers that seem to develop what you might describe as an arsenal of techniques and tools that they build up over the years. And then they can sort of refer to these things when they're starting a new composition. And there are others for whom the act of composition, the act of creation, goes hand in hand with the development of new techniques, new approaches in each successive work. I'm not aware of repeating myself, but I, I suppose I do. I mean, it's inevitable, isn't it, that, I mean, I'm 76 years old. I've been writing since I was four years old. Um, there's a there's a whole body of experience there which I, I I certainly rely on. I don't like to repeat myself in any obvious kind of way, and I'm always on the lookout for different things to do. But that's an aim, not necessarily a you know. I don't necessarily live up to my own expectation. <laughs> I try. Again, the whole the whole business of exploration because. It's new experiences all the time. And I like to push myself in the same way that I'd like to push my students. 
to try and get to the limits of experiences rather than uh, stay in the same area all the time. I mean, I, I grew up with an atonal going on serial, going on experimental period of music making, which now seems to have calmed down an awful lot. I'm not sure that I've calmed down an awful lot, but it colours or it coloured my experiences. I mean, I, I'm self, I was self-taught until I won a, a scholarship to the Royal College in London, and I was 19 then, 18, 19 years old. I'm pretty set, I suppose, in some ways, in my aims. Uh, I knew the kind of music I wanted to write, even if I wasn't yet finding it. I'm a contrapuntist rather than a harmonist. What more can one say? Um, you know, there are all these splendid generalizations that I've been presented with over the years, and they, they just confuse and get in the way too. So I'm trying to leapfrog over those when I'm writing. I like to surprise people. And presumably you're yourself first and foremost when you're actually writing. Uh, well, myself and the hypothetical other, yes. <laughs> what did the serial adventure of the mid 1950s mean to you when you were starting out when you were a student what did what sort um, of uh, approach did you have to those works were they immediately intriguing or was there a, a period of a phase of resistance I, I could never really understand the point of serialism per se I, I, I like the sound world I mean I like a lot of people I imagine by listening in order, I mean, I was very affected by the music of Satie to begin with, Debussy, of course, um, Bartok. But then when I got serious about composing, I think I was most influenced by Charles Ives, and Ives has remained a kind of uh, template uh, for composing. It's bringing things together. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was a card-carrying member of any particular uh, musico-political party. I like my freedom, freedoms of choice. And so the serial adventure, I was a kind of spectator too. I like Busotti's music a lot, and it didn't seem to me that he was a card-carrying member of any particular serial persuasion. Those kinds of techniques, if you can call them techniques, are at the service of other ideas, I think. The, the point of the music being not to demonstrate one's a good serialist. That, that was my view of it. I still look at serial works. I mean, the high serial works of Boulez and Stockhausen. I, I'm still interested in looking at them, although I think it's it's become the law of diminishing returns for me. I'm now still fond of listening to those pieces, less fond than I used to be. There's other, there's other places to go. Other things have happened. It's like the world. It changes all the time. There's a sense in which some of the most famous serial pieces are famous almost in spite of this technical dimension of the pieces. So Gruppen is famous because of the three orchestras and the spectacular dimension of the piece. The early Boulez piano sonatas are perhaps famous for their transgression, uh, for how far they go in terms of pianistic technique and, and texture. It's, it's not necessarily the technique itself that has made those works uh, well-known and memorable. No, but of course I have to think about technique all the time when I'm writing. So... Those ideas, those principles, I guess you would say most accurately as a principle, are still important. They have to be consulted and then discarded. Um, they have to be considered and then put on one side. Um, but then so do all the things I happen to know about tonal theory and tonal practice from jazzing. Everything can come potentially in, into play. It's a question of finding the right thing for what I'm doing at that moment. Well, some of the musical interests that you just described, to T, for example, are figures that at the time when you were young would have been considered fairly marginal figures, at least in terms of what a lot of continental composers were preoccupied with at the time. Then you have figures like Janacek, Sibelius, mm -hmm. who in a certain sense, were left out of the grand narrative that was being 
written around that time. So was that um, a difficult position to take in any sense? Difficult? No. I, li I like being outside the mainstream. I think there's more to life than grand narratives, isn't there? I mean, I, I, it's... I found Janacek's operas thanks to wonderful performances, Charles McCarris and Sadler's Wells Opera. When I was still in my late teens, I could have, over a space of two years or three years, probably heard all of Janacek's operas. And Janacek is far too interesting a composer to miss out on, in the same way as Sibelius is. And so I think I've spent a lifetime looking around the corners, searching in the dark places in rooms that are full of grand narratives, but uh, there is so much missed out. And grand narratives that we consider today to be significant are not going to be the grand narratives of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you look at music history, Meyerbeer was a grand narrative in the 19th century. And Meyerbeer is no longer part of any kind of grand narrative. Rather a shame, because he's not an uninteresting composer. Mm -hmm. oh, of course, of course. These things are continually reevaluated. And with respect to Janicek, um, I spent a couple of weeks with my students in Freiburg looking at On an Overgrown Path, which is a, almost a, an inexhaustible work. And what's yeah. fascinating to me about this music, actually, is it does almost nothing that you would expect, at least certainly not for music of that period. And it's, it's utterly distinctive in, in every dimension. There's nothing else that sounds like it. Frankly, Samuel, I'm, I'm, I'm too busy doing other things to try and form, formulate grand narratives. It's not my job to do that. It's enough of a struggle surviving in this world as a composer, let alone trying to be part of a grand narrative. It wouldn't be the choice I'd make anyway. If I wanted grand narratives, I'd have become a pop musician. <laughs> Of course, yeah. No, I mean, grand narratives in the sense that it would have been perhaps seen at the time by certain people, but obviously there's a, uh, a significant amount of simplification and self-serving uh, repurposing of narrative that goes into that. In the latter part of my life, I, I, I was teaching at a university and amongst musicologists, and musicologists are fond of grand narratives, I think. They, they, they like to sort things out, arrange things in the right order. But that's not, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to explore and find things. And, that's and, something then, that, reveal, and then reveal them. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's, that's something that comes at the end of the Harmony Lehre of Schoenberg. He basically says he hopes that his students and the people reading his books will continue to explore for the rest of their lives, which is a wonderful, wonderful sentiment. Teaching teaches you how to learn. As a teacher, I, I learned a tremendous amount from my students. I should have been paying them, really. <laughs> yeah, do you, do you still teach? Very occasionally. So what concretely has teaching brought to your practice as a composer? Is there a sense in which your work has changed, do you think, as a result of it, in, in any definable sense? Oh, I expect so, yes. I, I mean, it broadens one's outlook, because if, if a student asks you a complicated question about something that you, is not part of your habitual practice, you have to search... Uh, and, re and research. I go over to the library and, and read up on stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, what sort of student were you, actually? This is something I'm curious about. Did you feel, uh, in, in, in any sense, like a, an autodidact or somebody that was essentially having to educate themselves as they were going along? Because I've heard that you didn't actually take very much from your, your teachers. Really? Um, I learned a tremendous amount from Bernard Stevens. But I, I suspect I was a totally obnoxious student because I'm quite strongly self-willed about what I do. But Stevens was a very fine contrapuntist and he knew that that's what interested me in particular. So he found ways of revealing the principles of counterpoint to me in ways that I'd not thought of, 
And that was very, very helpful. I've passed all those tips on to my students, um, depending on their inclinations. And I still think about him a lot. Um, he was a very fine and is now a very much neglected composer. Composers do get swept under carpets sometimes, don't they? People lose sight and track of, of them because it's a very crowded arena at the same time as being of very little interest to the general public. So it's just, you're dicing with death most of the time. Yeah, there were a lot of predictions when Elliot Carter passed away, also Goulez, that after this happened, there would be a, a, a lag in interest in their work. And that this often happens, in fact, uh, but temporarily, you know, the composer's outputs are being reevaluated all the time. And sometimes they fall out of favor and return to favor, and there's nothing one can do about that, I suppose. Bill Corran, who was a very considerable musician, and he he was involved with Universal Edition, whom I was with, uh, who I was with for, for 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 a while. He said there are two types of composer: one that publishers have to market strenuously because they've got a very short shelf life, and there are other composers who are going to be there forever, so publishers don't invest in them quite so much because they know they're going to be around. They're, they're easy, um, easy to deal with, or rather to not deal with, because you know they'll take care of themselves. And that's an interesting point of view, but I think history reveals lots of anomalies um, about composers we now consider to be very highly significant who were not thought significant in the past. Well, the example that the, the example that always immediately comes to mind for me is Webern, who was horrifically treated during his lifetime. He had a, an absolutely awful life um, in many respects. And one of the things that's interesting, I find, I'd love, love to get your thoughts about this, about late Webern, is he was not getting any performances in the last couple of decades of his life. Not that he ever had that many to begin with, but that neglect, that absence of performances, seems to have changed the music significantly. It seems to have gotten considerably more, even more inward than it had been previously, even more abstract, even more removed from the world. And that seems to have been a direct consequence of that neglect. It also might mirror the times that Webern lived in. After all, after 1933, life was difficult and and different from what it had been before in Germany. Fabian stayed, stayed there and worked in any way he could. I mean, he conducted quite a lot. He was a fine conductor, apparently. You know, on circumstances, the context in which you work, the socio-political context in which you work also has an enormous impact on what what you do. Performers change. There was a time when performers didn't want to be controlled by the composer. They would prefer to have diagrammatic or inexact kinds of, of straw to work work from. Nowadays, people prefer the straw to be fully notated and um, they can be very tricky, um, but performers would still rather have the notes that they're supposed to, to play. Some countries, it's easier to rehearse for a long time. In England, you're very lucky to get two or three hours, uh, even for an orchestral piece. So it, you have to examine the circumstances uh, of a composer's work, the, the working environment, I would suggest to younger composers that building up a repertory company of, of, of performers is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Because what you really lack these days, because it's so commercialized, is a, is, a, is a kind of trust that you really need in order to experiment technically. Webern's late music can be very beautiful. I would, I would, I, it is very beautiful, but it's very difficult to to bring that off in performance. I, I was lucky enough to work um, with Dorothy Doro, who had sung Webern's work and recorded Webern's work. And we did all Webern's songs together. Um, and it was an eye-opener because actually playing them, you get a completely different view 
bar by bar, note by note, nuance by nuance. Whereas a, as an audience, you're often confused by the fact that the pieces don't really last long enough for you to grasp anything. Um, and the concentration span you need to, uh, it's very intense, very intense music. And it loses, um, I think in some respects, it bears a resemblance to Mondrian's painting. Mm. So suddenly representationalism, and also in a sense in musical terms, a, a musical dramaturgy disappear from Webern's later work. And I think age has a lot to do with it too, because you can't go on being a teenager forever. But there's a sense in which the instrumental substance of those works becomes considerably more abstract, bordering on indifferent, in fact. So if you if you compare something like the Bagatelles for string quartet or the, the six pieces for orchestra to the variations for orchestra, Opus 30, many of the subtle refinements in tone color that are present in the earlier works have completely disappeared by that point. And have they? I would I would argue if you if you look at the the density of information in the bagatelles, the colenio tratto, the sol ponticello, the tremoli, and so on, there's considerably less of that. It seems to me anyway. Perhaps I've got this wrong, but there's um, less of this fantastical investment in tone color in those works. But then there's a difference between Hilde Radiona's poetry and Richard Demo and responding to an environment before the First World War and then the nightmare of in, you know, rampant inflation during the 1920s in Germany. I mean, these sorts of things are not stuff that composers ignore. They're, they're involved in it. You know, if you, if you go shopping for bread and cheese or whatever it is, you're aware of price rises and so on and so forth. And the stress of existing in those environments makes a difference to you psychologically. Uh, and I can't imagine that, the, I mean, composers are often strongly in denial about the real world, but they nonetheless have to, they have to exist in it. It's, it's not all pretense. Um, mm. I can imagine any number of reasons why why Webern would change from Opus 5 to Opus 25. There's a lot of things have happened. The psychology of the time, the psychology of the composer uh, are altered by circumstance. Mm -hmm. You have to mm -hmm. you you can't be obsessive about a technical apparatus which you suddenly find is out of step with the times. What do you mean by that? In the sense that, a, 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 let's well, say... Well, consider a... Stravinsky, for example. There's, a, there's an enormous difference between the first works of Stravinsky and the late ones, which caused a lot of problems for Stravinsky in his life, I imagine, because people thought he was going bonkers every time he, he turned a corner. But why not? Mm -hmm. It's always Stravinsky. You can, you can hear in movements for piano and orchestra, exactly the same sound well that you hear in the symphonies for wind instruments, mm. and for that matter, parts of Firebird. Oh, yes. It, well, there's, there's, a there's a touch, isn't there, that's uniquely his. It, it, it has something to do with the instrumental substance, with the, artic the sense of articulation of rhythm. Uh, well, I think it has very fundamentally to do with things like chord voicing and pacing and particular kinds of rhythmic configuration that characterize, but which come from very deep inside uh, a person, and you're not really aware of them, I think. And I, I don't believe he was replicating himself consciously all the time. I think he thought he was going on nice adventures too. Mm -hmm. And there are some works, uh, Persephone, for example, where he really takes enormous strides in a particular direction, which then seems not to have been followed up. Mm. Maybe there are circumstances for that too. Um, but it's, it, it, it's a gorgeous piece of music, which for, for one reason or another is not very often performed. And there are these enormous gaps, aren't there, in Stravinsky performance. Mm. 
where well, the we move, can't keep the the movements are almost never steps. done. The, nobody no, exactly. No, well, you know, or the one day. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame because if anyone can be accurately described as a, I don't like this term, but a, a star of the of that world, it's certainly Stravinsky. But the vast majority of the output seems to be largely ignored, which is. Uh, I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd say concerning exactly, but it's it's a strange state of affairs that that nobody would do the Huxley variations, for example. Yeah, well, they're extraordinary, and it, it's a great it's a great shame they're not heard more often. But uh, you know, with the, I didn't 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 really want to get into this kind of conversation, but the 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 economics of the of the music business would like every composer to write one piece. Mm -hmm. You know, Ravel, Bolero, mm -hmm. Tchaikovsky, 1812 Overture. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is sort of marginalized mm -hmm. and subjugated to that, that one work. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of Reader's Digest approach to music culture. Well, it's ticking, great... it's, it's ticking boxes, isn't it? It's like you, if you've heard Bolero, then you've sort of engaged with Ravel, you know? Yeah, well... You have to engage with Ravel, but very partially. With respect to Stravinsky, if we could stay on that for a, for a second, there's a sense in which Stravinsky, of course, referred to models throughout his career of various kinds in his in his work. So, either Russian folklore or uh, Italian opera or 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 Webern or whatever it might have been, um, and that these things would would provide him with a kind of impetus to reinvent himself. I. Imagine you can see where I'm going with this. Is there is there a sense in which you would have a kinship with that sort of approach, given yes. that a lot of your work consists of various forms of adaptations, transcriptions, reimaginings, um, explicit references to the music of the past? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, it's a very lonely life being a composer, and um, one can have friends in the past. They don't. They don't argue. They also don't tell you you're an idiot. <laughs> well, we have other people who do that. So, oh yes, <laughs> lots and lots, lots and lots. Yeah, yeah. Um, what What does originality mean in this context? Then, because there's a there's a sense that uh, originality there's there's a high premium placed upon originality and in Western art generally since the Renaissance, but arguably more and more since the Romantic era. And um, I'm wondering what your relationship to that term might be. I think originality lies in what you do with whatever it is you're doing. Um, so if, if we can for a moment accept that material might be Russian folklore or neoclassicism or whatever it is, it's not so much that you've chosen to do that, or for me, you know, the bugbear complexity. It's not the fact that I'm doing complex things, it's how I'm doing it, I think, where the originality lies. Mm -hmm. it's how I put a piece of music together, what I choose to do structurally, um, as I said before, pitch choices, rhythmic choices, all, all of that stuff, that's, that's the originality. In mm -hmm. other respects, I'm quite happy, in fact, to test myself. Um, that's how the, the thing with older music started. I wanted to test whether I could actually compose with, without parody, somebody else's material. If I, if I take a page of a Schubert piano sonata, can I turn it into something I'm happy to have composed myself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the originality lies in what you're doing with something, rather than what the thing itself might be. If I could go a little bit farther with that idea, does it re reflect also the, the notion that the material itself, in a sense, is a starting point or a pretext, but it's not the most important thing? What, what is important is what happens to the material, what happens to the, to the material over the course of the work. In time, isn't that the point of all of Beethoven after the Fifth Symphony, or maybe even before, that Beethoven's sketchbooks reduce material which anybody would have given their, you know, prize money 
to have invented, but he, re he reduces everything to very simple things that a child could have written almost. Because what he wants to show you is the composing. And perhaps if I can use the example of painting, when people look at a painting, they're happy usually to identify the subject of that painting or something very general if it's, if it's more abstract about the shapes. But in actual fact, nobody looks at the paint mm. or very few people do. Very few people look at the way the paint is applied to the canvas. And that's what's really interesting. And what, what people tend not to do is to listen to what the composer is doing. He's that's doing wonderful. Notes, whether he's doing it with notes or whether he's doing it with pitches, rhythms, whatever it is, something is happening which is composing. And so you can't say, oh, yeah, I, that, that, th th this thing is Feldman. You know, Feldman is all quiet and chords and slow. But that's not what's happening, is it? The, the, something extraordinary is happening in action every microsecond of, of the work. And I guess you need to just, just put up with the fact that a lot of people are going to miss that. Maybe they're only going to get to it very slowly. But that, yeah, there's that's a, where the originality lies. There's a remark by Dutio who said something to that effect. He said that most people in his experience, most audience members that he would speak to, were capable only of pointing out specific moments in the piece. So they would say something like, oh, I love that moment when there was the brass fanfare, or they'd refer to you know, the, pit, the section with all the pizzicati and the double basses or something. But they wouldn't be capable of following a musical trajectory and he, hearing it in those terms. And um, to expand upon your painting analogy, it's sort of like Cezanne in his paintings of apples. It wasn't that he had some kind of a weird crush on apples. You know, it's not about the damn apples or Monet with the haystacks, you know. It's about painterly qualities and qualities of light and composition and the apples are just a pretext if you're going to spend that length of time with a brush in your hand or with a pen in your hand writing you've got to be really interested and committed to what you're doing and that's the difference that you know it it, it might take me six months to write 10 minutes of music and that's that's going quite fast but the audience only spend 10 minutes with it yeah is, is 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 there a sense in which the the process is more important than the result of the process what is your attitude towards completed works are you still interested in them are they still yeah. yes of course sometimes i correct them if i think they've gone but they weren't and I, I, um, I mean, only tweaking, you know. Um, are they, once or twice, I've given them a good old shake up because um, when people find out that you can write fairly quickly, they ask you at the last minute to write something which a much slower composer has failed to deliver on time. That's happened to me a lot often with fairly major, major pieces. And I was for a long time in Brian Fernier's shadow. He's a friend of mine, so that was a very awkward position to be in. But when Brian didn't finish something, I was usually asked if I could get something ready for a concert. And so I was then under pressure to finish something in two or three months, which Brian hadn't completed in two or three years. Mm. And so I did the work to the best of my ability, but often I didn't really work as much out as I would have liked to. And if I had managed to do that by some, some chance, then I've, I've left those works alone. But I remember 
the, uh, the agony of, of, of writing against the clock. And those pieces, I have a little list. I go back to those pieces and I re-examine them. And if there's something I can do, not, not totally neglecting everything about them, but just reordering some things. It can be a, a very small thing to touch up or it can be a fairly major shift of, of some sort. Then I, do, I want to do it. I, I want to leave behind me pieces which are in a good condition rather than in a damaged one because if they're if they are damaged and pretty obviously then somebody doesn't say either something nasty about them or somebody else might even want to finish them better you know improve them it's also a good excuse not to play them i mean which is what happened with bruno baderna for example in the decades after his death yeah. because his, his scores were in a in dreadful condition you yeah. know uh, he didn't take care of them at all and they were put together at, in great haste in many in many uh, instances yeah. So uh, you're not always in complete control of, of 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 how you write a piece. People will put you under various kinds of pressure. Yeah, and you can never get completely out from under that because, well, because you're a limited person who exists in the world, and you're beholden to all kinds of existential issues. I suppose that. That's just that's just how it is. You're 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 limited in terms of uh, how much time you can devote to things and what your resources are and what external circumstances are dictating. Yeah, what are the alternatives? Well, I suppose the alternative. I mean, the, the counter example would be someone like Stockhausen, who had this almost megalomaniacal drive to preserve his own work and went to extraordinary lengths. Uh, going so far as to have essentially a team of people around him at all times, copyists and assistants and so on. That's maybe an extreme example, and it's hard to think of too many other people in the 20th century that had a similar apparatus around them. I think Stockhausen's timing was pretty good too, because he had a very good start. His career, his, his musical career, I don't like the word career very much, but whatever you want to call it, um, was well supported. He sort of arrived at the right time. So with that kind of start, you can probably build build on it if you're astute. And he was, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and the people around him seem to have believed in him um, to an almost excessive degree. So I'm sure that has its up and the down side as well. But it's not everybody that gets that kind of star treatment no no indeed well one of the things that's striking about it you can read interviews with him from the 1970s and 80s in which he complains actually bitterly about how poorly he's been treated by the german musical establishment and you know uh, how he's not taken seriously as an artist and so on and uh, he, he had a kind of bitterness despite the extraordinary good fortune that he had in some respects although who knows, perhaps growing up an orphan and having to witness the atrocities of the war had something to do with that. Everybody has their cross to bear. Indeed. You've described yourself as, a, as an outsider. And I want to get into that a little bit, if we could. I mean, outsider with respect to what? With respect to institutional musical life in Britain? Or yes. outside, outsider perhaps in, a, in an aesthetic sense? Or how, how would you describe this? I certainly feel, feel outside um, the general run of music life in, in the UK. Um, I don't feel particularly isolated aesthetically, and I have a lot of composer friends. So in, in some senses, I'm not really outside, uh, totally outside, but a, a lot of my composer friends are also outside. I don't know. I, it's a... It's a it's just a feeling. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's bad for the music. In fact, I think it's probably rather the reverse. I think it's probably good for the music to be forced into a position of um, going your own way. Well, maybe there's a sense in which your work, or at least the, the early work, didn't certainly didn't slot into any kind of pre-existing category. So I can imagine that 
when you first came out with your early compositions that it must have been it must have been difficult for audiences and programmers to understand what to do with a composer like you yes possibly i think i'm probably i would probably be more concerned about what happened now than i was then because i've got a a broader grasp of what the fallout from those kind of things can be the long term consequences okay. hmm? the long term consequences the long term consequences yes exactly but that's only in terms of survival you do seem to have survived i seem to still be surviving <laughs> um yeah well i'm very stubborn Sur surviving in the sense that you of course are, are a very well-known figure and you have a substantial work list of important compositions wonderful compositions uh and and you've you know you've you've kept on doing it most people well, do it's not very, it's very it's 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 wonderful to hear you say those words but it doesn't help me get to the next piece mm. so i have to keep going anyway and that was easier when there were less people saying you're doing something that i think is worthwhile oh that's interesting i would have thought the opposite i would have imagined a somewhat beleaguered state of affairs you know, when you were in your 20s and 30s, uh, trying to get these things played, outside of the things that you could play yourself, of course. Um, but it's hard for me to imagine what that time must have been like. Did you take uh, any kind of umbrage from the companionship of people like Brian? You know, from, yes. uh, Brian was extraordinarily helpful um, because he arranged my first piano concert in Freiburg. Um, and so I then had to determine what kind of concert I wanted to do. That that was that was very good because um, I didn't really want to play old music. I had a lot of composer friends who weren't being played that I wanted to play. So that was good. We, for a long time, we'd already exchanged letters. Sometimes two or three times a week. I've got. My desk, which you can't see, is 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 jammed full of those kind of mementos. Um, and we used to exchange our thoughts about composing, about the circumstances we were in, and so that 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 was supportive. And, and other composer friends and writer friends, I know a lot of uh, poets, um, and it's good to talk to people about what they're doing. Uh, and there's some, there was something reckless about that time which just spurred you on. It was like a, being on a um, one of those things in the fairground, you know, where you can't, can't stop it. And uh, so you just have to take whatever comes. And that's exciting when you're 20 to maybe 40, and then it, it gets a bit exhausting. Do you mean in aesthetic terms, in in, in terms of a, yeah. a rapid rapid invention of uh, entirely new musical continents? Yeah, you know, it's testosterone, and it it well, there's still a bit of that, but it's once you've covered a lot of space, then the danger of replication, you know, the danger of writing a work for the second time um, is that much greater because you've, you've covered an awful lot of territory. So it, it gets much tougher. And the axe tends to fall first on the tallest tree, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I've been engaging with recently, I'd really like to get your thoughts on this, are the, are the, the very late works of certain composers and, and poets. Uh, who reach a point where they've got a certain body of work behind them, they know what they've already done, and there's a kind of extraordinary feeling of freedom that starts to manifest itself in the sense that, well, I've done all of this. What is there still that I could do? What have I not done? What, uh, what shapes can I try out? What approaches can I try? I'm thinking of people like um, Betsy Jolas in France, for example, who's now 96 years old, and... Uh, her attitude is quite remarkable because she's getting a lot of commissions. And the idea is always, well, what do I do now? I've already written 200 pieces, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so 
And she can take risks, of course, in a, in a way that uh, perhaps is not so easy when you're younger, or certain types of risks. I think there's a kind of watershed, which I found when I, I, I got to 60, where suddenly people started taking what I said seriously. And that, that is a, a big permission, because you really do feel that you can write just exactly what you want to. Um, which may or may not be true in actual terms, but it, it's it's a kind of useful illusion. Also, you start being aware that you're running out of time. And so there is a kind of urgency about creation, which is also a powerful stimulant. I don't know Betsy Jellis very well. There's a, there's a wonderful piece of hers, uh, for coloratura, soprano, and string trio, called oh, Catulum. Yes. The, the second Cature. And I met her very briefly at a Royan Festival in 1970s, mid 1970s. And I've played her piano works on concerts. There's something very special about them and about her, I think, as a person too. Um, I don't know what she's doing at the moment because we don't have very good communications now with the BBC and, and new music. It, they, there tends to be a lot, well, there's, there's a lot more new music to cover, but uh, composers like Betsy Jellis do not get played very much here. So unless I find a CD or unless I, I'm hunting through catalogues, publishers, particularly of French music, all the French music publishers seem to have been swallowed up by big conglomerates, and then you oh, just yeah. don't see the work anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the publishers are definitely in a bad way in France. There's no question about that. Yeah. I worked as a copyist for 10 years, so I worked for all those big firms. Yeah, uh, they're, they're not able to provide any kind of meaningful service for the composers they have under their wing. That's clear. Uh, well, even Zanakis is, is, you just don't see it anymore. Mm -hmm. Strange, isn't it? Well, it's a business that's that's mutating, clearly. And uh, it's hard to predict what it's going to look like in 10 or 20 years, but I, I definitely don't think it will look anything like the way it did in the 1970s and 80s. There, will, there may very well be increasing numbers of composers that just uh, bypass them altogether. Why give up you know, a certain percentage of your performing rights uh, in order to have your works published by somebody that's not going to do anything with them. Well, there's still a kind of vanity about publishing that gives you a sense of credibility. And it does, e particularly for large-scale works, not that I write very many of those, but for large-scale works, or orchestra, it's, it's easier to have a publisher store all the material on their shelves and try and crowd out your own room with it. Yeah, that is of course true. Yeah, it's it's completely different for large scale projects like orchestra pieces and operas and so on. Um, and a publisher becomes necessary at that point. So, what are your present day obsessions, preoccupations, musically speaking? What are the things that are that are uh, driving your interest at the moment? I made it my mission, kind of right at the start, almost to bring as many things together as I could to create relationships between different, what I, what one is taught are different types of music, but which I see as a, as a universal constant. So I like, I like to bring things together and I find things all the time. It was funny. We were talking about Webern. Um, I was thinking about Dorothy Durrow the other day. I like writing songs uh, if I can find a singer. And at the moment, I, I have found a singer who's very lovely, a very nice personality as a performer. And so I'm thinking about writing songs. And mm. I um, engaged with Webern um, as a sort of successor to Schubert. Mm. So that's what I'm investigating. Um, but in fact, I've got an outstanding commission for quarter tone accordion, uh, which has caused me some problems. 
for some reason, having quarter tones available on a keyboard, or actually on buttons in the case of this accordion, um, makes them a little bit less interesting than if you have to make them inflectionally. Mm. So it's harder to shape phrases when the pitches are already all there. I mean, it's a similar problem to write for the piano, that you have to find a way of making the instrument breathe and sing, um, which is harder when it's, well, Harry Part refers to it as um, um, the black and white keys like prison bars, doesn't he? He says something like that. Um, and it, it, it does become very difficult to, to deal with the readily available um, because you feel that I'm used to shaping it another way. And of course, you can hear, one can hear and sing quarter tones. It, that's not the problem. But you, you then write a shapely phrase which you've sung inside your head anyway, or outside. And it doesn't sound anything like that on the instrument. It sounds clunky. Mm. And um, so I've got to get over that hurdle. Some of the piece, I've, I've been writing it for quite a while now. And um, some of it's going very well. And I'm working with a wonderful player. She's, she's immensely tolerant and helpful. Um, but there's something, something in here that's not quite working yet. It, does it have to do with instrumental gesture, with, with a, uh, an idea of what's actually going on ergonomically to produce the sounds? So, yeah, I mean, obviously, as, as a pianist, of course, you, you can, I, I would imagine you would have a kind of proprioception that would allow you, even if you're not seated at a keyboard, to imagine the hand positions and the, the dexterity that's required to do certain actually, configurations. Actually, it's totally different, though, on, uh, e even on the organ or on harmonium. The kind of result of making hand <laughs> hand movements um, is totally different, but you can find one can find it. I mean, you just have to have to be patient, and there will be a way uh, to get the sounds I imagine out 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 there onto the accordion. But it's taking a while. Well, when you're working with microtones, let's take the string trio, for example. How mm -hmm. precisely do you go about working out those harmonies, those tones, those there, exquisite microtonal harmony in that piece? Are you able to audiate it? Do you need to try it out on something? Is it um, Because those are, I'm stating the obvious, those are hard things to hear in a certain sense. Uh, I guess they are, but then... The style of C major is a hard thing to hear if you're thinking about working with it. We have to do an awful lot of problem solving. So one needs ingenuity to, uh, to, to make it work. I, mean, I was lucky with, I've been very, very lucky with performers and the Galliano trio for, for whom I wrote the, the string trio were all very able at articulating quarter tones. So in actual fact, it was relatively easy to assemble people together or one, one, of, one at a time to actually try that stuff through. And I have a pretty good ear, so I, I, I'm able to hear and uh, realize my vision um, accurately. Mm -hmm. But I mean, were you having I to mean, think about about hand positions on the on the string instruments, you know where you would be re with respect to the the uh, the fingerboard and and well, for some odd reason, I've worked for years with the Kreutzer Quartet too, and um, they find it quite strange that I don't play a stringed instrument, but I seem to have an innate sense of how to write for stringed instrument. Mm. But I think that has to do with watching and listening, and experiment. I mean, the, I do have a theoretical side where I make lots of charts and numerical games and things of that sort, just to stimulate things in the first place. And then I, then I, it's like, it's like digging up clay and then you mold the clay when you've got something there. But that, I've accepted that's part of, part of how you write, or it's part of how I write. Um, and it's a balance between intuitive and improvising, jazzing, because I do a lot of that, 
and having a theoretical basis to provide other things as a, as a counterweight to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really actually quite curious about that, about the interaction between your activities as a, as a performer uh, and the composition side of things, because there are things in some of the, uh, in some of the piano works that uh, are, I mean, you can't, at least I can't, and maybe that's the limits of my imagination, but I, I can't imagine improvising something like that. When, when you were experimenting with extremely complex forms of visual notation, and the, some of the very early things, Song 9, for example, was that for you related to a, a gestural idea, a pianistic idea, or was, did you have other priorities at that time? Well, I had a lot of v visual training because there was no music at school. So I was, because they didn't know what to do with me, they, they chucked me in the art class. So the art, the art teacher knew I was not going to be, they were training um, commercial artists, you know, for advertising and so on. Uh, I had no aptitude for that, whatever. But the, the art teacher, um, actually, he was the father of Peter Frampton, a pop musician. So he was interested in the fact that I, I wanted to be a musician. Um, and he said, why didn't I just concentrate on pen and ink work and um, learn about artists that, that were doing that sort of thing? And so I went and read a lot of books in the library about artists and painters. I, um, a, a good school friend of mine was very keen on going to art galleries. And we used to go to, there's a gallery in London, I can't remember the name of it now. It's in Al the Aldwych area of, of, of London, the East End. And they uh, housed the first of David Hockney's retrospective exhibitions, which I went to. And they also housed the first exhibit here of Robert Rauschenberg's um, Dante illustrations. So I got very used to the visual controls, which you also need to master as a composer if you're, if you're notating, because you need to have as much freedom as you possibly can to express yourself visually. And the eye and the ear must learn to work together mm. because there are infinite number of ways in which you can notate a sound. So you hear a sound, what do you put down on paper if you're going to uh, realize it that way? Um, and above all, I was encouraged by my dad to take an interest in film. So I also went illegally, and I was about two or three years underage when I started going to the uh, British Film Institute, National Film Theatre in London. But I saw an awful lot of silent film and I saw the New York underground filmmakers when they came to London and bought all the literature and read up and uh, went to the filmmakers co-op showings in London. Um, you had to sit on the floor and they showed Andy Warhol's Chelsea Girls and things like that. So I, I was very aware of gesture in film. And there are directors, Stan Brackage, Gregory Matropoulos, who are extraordinarily musical and very, very interesting in the way they edit film images together. It's not based on telling a narrative. It's actually more like you start from the concept of a painting and you explode the painting into time. So Markopoulos will divide images and pair them with a black or white leader. So you just get a blank screen, well, not blank screen, it's, it's either white or black. And then there's a film by Derek Jarman as it happens, his last film called Blue, which is a blue screen for the entire duration of the, of the film. Oh, that's, that's quite interesting. That relates to the things like the Warhol film of the Empire State Building and Sleep yeah. and, and those sorts of things. Um, yeah, but it also still, people think there's only one image, but there isn't. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right, of course, yeah. Well, there's also an early student film by David Lynch, Six Men Getting Sick, which was mm -hmm. a, a painting, in fact, that he a static image that he turned into a film. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the yeah, idea no, of 
Well, the, the idea of, of exploding an image into 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 the temporal dimension is extremely interesting, and so yeah. so that's something that that you were uh, in in some manner or another attempting to do, to do musically as well, like starting from a, a visual image. Uh, yes, in fact, Song Nine is is absolutely indebted to Gregory Martropoulos. It is it it is a film in sound. Mm. That's how I think of it. <laughs> um, I don't think that would help anybody to perform it particularly. But, um, <laughs> that's what they are. I mean, I because I was trying to make use of what I knew. And I didn't know anything about Haydn piano sonatas, but I, I did know an awful lot about underground American cinema. And Busati, presumably. And Busati. One reason to get very interested in Busati was that his scores also are very intensely visual. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of them are. You've spoken a couple of times about, about pitch being important here, and there's a wonderful mm-hmm. quote by Feldman. It's a simple quote, but he just said, pitch is a beautiful thing. And... Uh, I wonder if we could talk about that for a minute, about how you work with pitch exactly, because my sense has often been that in musicology, pitch is given too much importance as a, uh, a vector of musical meaning, uh, that there are other things that are perhaps more immediate. Rhythm, for example, gesture, timbre. Pitch, of course, uh, has its place, but analysts and musicologists often concentrate exclusively on it to the detriment of pretty much every other dimension of a composition, you know. So, what does pitch represent for you as a as a composer? That's perhaps a perhaps an imbecilic question, but no, no, not at all. Um, I think it's more or less, uh, different composers have different ways of thinking about it and different priorities. There are some composers I, I've I've worked with who are really not interested in pitch, or not to the extent that I am, and not sensitive to it in the in ways that I might be. Um, Bonita Marcus told me an interesting story, since you mentioned Feldman, that Feldman would sit at the piano for hours playing a chord and trying different pitches one at a time. So if the, if the chord had six pitches, he would take one pitch away, change it, play the chord again. And that, that, he'd try it for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And I really can identify with that. I will sit at the piano for hours fiddling around with, with, with pitches. I went through a period where I had to systematize pitch by using either random numbers or magic squares or things which were beyond my ear, my, my intuitive sense. And that was very helpful. I learned a lot of things about chord spacing and uh, how pitches related to each other that I've subsequently been able to make use of. Um, tonality still interests me um, because of the inherent tensions and relaxations that you get in, the, in, in a in a sequence of pitches. Um, but of course, all of this, you can't really talk about pitch unless you talk about rhythm, because if you play pitches in a different rhythm, you will get a different result. Um, there's an experiment I, I made in a piece called Contratenza, where the basic musical material is the first um, few items, first produce and fugues, in the 48 produced by um, Bach. And actually, I found out that if you speed up the first fugue subject, you get something that sounds an awful lot like Macedonian folk music. Hmm. Um, Which proves, I think, that pitch without rhythm doesn't make very much sense. But the relative way in which you prioritize pitch and rhythm we're talking about originality, characterizes you as a composer. Yeah, there's a a wonderful short article by Jonathan Harvey where he talks about this, about the the effects that the dissolution of the bass function and harmony has had on composers. Jonathan was very preoccupied with that. Mm -hmm. 
uh, he, he, I knew him very well. He, he once said to me after performance of a piece of mine, did you realize you hadn't used the bass register at all? And I said to him, well, yes, I, it, was, it was deliberate. Um, and I do that because I don't want to anchor the sounds. I don't want them to feel grounded at all. I wanted them to float. It comes from a, a silly reason. Uh, I came across very early on uh, Nono's Il Canto Sospeso. And I thought the very odd thing about that is that it doesn't necessarily always sound very sospeso. Mm. So I got to thinking, how do I make sound which is really suspended above a, a sort of terra firma? So I'd, I'd, I still don't work that often with... I don't like the sound of functional bass kind of approach to compose. That's to do with counterpoint again, of course. I'm sorry, I'm not slightly off the topic here. No, no, not at all. It's it's a it's it's a broad and, and nebulous topic, so it it um, can branch off onto other, onto other things. Well, I think the thing is that when you when you introduce timbre into the mix, um, you have to be aware of the differences um, that different instruments when they play the same pitch, uh, it, it will sound different. And if you start putting pitches together, um, you will get all the thing with different tones and subharmonics and so on and so forth, which characterize then, as well as timbre, because that changes the way you hear a sound and the way that in a texture, um, particularly dense textures, you can isolate sounds by creating different timbral mixes. That, that's just part of one's training mm -hmm. um, and experience. And you get to know what works for you and what doesn't. And I don't myself consider that orchestration can be added later. Mm -hmm. So if I were going to write for an ensemble or for an orchestra, I haven't written very much for orchestra. I would have to work in either full score. The first pieces I wrote for orchestra all, were all written uh, straight away in full score, or with a very detailed particel, um, say something like six or eight staves, in which one could indicate in detail timbre mixes, because it becomes then part of the composition. The same is true, though, of a string quartet. And for that matter, a piano, you, the timbre of the piano is not even from one end to the other. So you have to consider what you're doing. Well, what I'm gathering from this is, in a certain sense, it's nonsensical to treat pitch as, a, as an entirely independent parameter. You can't do it because it's too in, intrinsically tied up with rhythm, timbre, and, and gesture, and all sorts of other things that uh, yeah. you... You know, it's all um, it's all part of the same package. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's that. There's a there's a certain lineage in in composition that has always greatly interested me, which I suppose I would define as Varez, Stravinsky, Feldman. You know, where they they had a sense of the the holistic enterprise of a pitch interacting with all of these other. Uh, parameters in a very specific way that you, you cannot extricate it out. I think Verez made something of a business of isolating that aspect. But then he was a pioneer of a certain kind of approach to instrumentation at a time when probably ideas about orchestration, maybe Wagnerian or Debussyan or wh whatever it was, kind of style of orchestration which I think he probably wasn't that interested in, uh, were dominant. And so to assert something alternative, he, 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 he did tend to make more of the instrumental groups than, other, than one would normally do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I'm very interested in Verez. Verez was another <clears throat> was another composer that I I got to grips with when I was in my early teens in the secondary school um, because there was a very good library ne next to the school. But there's something else about Verez's music which I'm not particularly in tune with compositionally. I mean, I lo I love it. I love I love the sound of his work and. Uh, lots of other things about the music, but it wasn't something that I wanted to steal. Yeah, it, it would be hard to think of an immediate connection between Varez and some of the things that you've written. That's true. Um, but I, I want to get back onto the topic of harmony somewhat. You, you, spoke, you mentioned that there was a process you went through that involved systematizing the pitches through various procedures. Um, should I understand from that, that uh, you've moved away from that, that you're working perhaps less systematically or more intuitively or uh, more improvisationally with uh, with harmony as a dimension of your work now? I think every now and again I get, I feel I'm in a rut. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in a particular way of doing stuff. So I then... I then theorize and randomize and try experimental ways of generating a different kind of sound world. And it probably winds up being very similar to the, to the one before, but I fresh, freshened it up. It's a sort of cleansing process, I suppose you'd say. Hmm. Well, I would have to imagine that if you're, if you're writing works on a certain time scale, you know, you, you have to, project the music on a scale of an hour or more, an hour and a half, um, particularly very dense works, there would be, a, there would be a, an issue of how exactly do you do that? Um, you know, I, I think of this also in relation to things like Sur Incise of Boulez, where the, there's just a, the, the, the density of information in that piece is so great that you can't imagine sitting down and writing something like that if you actually had to sit and think about every single pitch. The, the, the labor would be too much. With respect to your own output, with respect to some of the very large piano cycles that you've composed, uh, some of which are unbelievably dense in their, in their harmonies and their textures, I mean, how, how could you approach writing something like that if you, if you really had to sit and puzzle over every single pitch? Well, you can't. You have to train yourself as a painter does, to um, work in, in, in kind of layering. So a painter, when he prepares a canvas, then you, you bring... Well, it's harder to paint a light colour over a dark one, for example, than it is to paint a dark colour over a light one. So you don't use treating layers of information. It's impossible. I mean, if you could load a pen with ink and then just go on the paper and get a thousand notes, some people think that would be a terrific thing. <laughs> um, it's quite nice though to, to work painstakingly at, at every little detail. It's, it's, it's great. It's a, it's, a, it's a good way to spend time. And it's instructive because you can, all these little details of gesture are also very characterful. So orchestration, even in a sense of, let's say, writing for string quartet, you can only write one layer at a time, or you can write one note at a time, basically, can't you? So as you're writing that one note, you may be thinking of the next one, you may be thinking of six in a row, and as you write those six, maybe you get to number five and you change your mind about six. So it's a very painstaking process, but you just get used to it. That is what technique is about. It's about the training that enables you to do that without feeling awkward or at a loss or unbalanced or something else. Um, you have to remain in a sense upright. You have to remain agile in the way that gymnasts do. That's why I, I don't stop writing for long periods of time, because it, it worries me that I would get back and be out of training. Mm -hmm. So I keep my ears occupied all the time. I keep my eyes occupied all the time. <laughs> 
because they're what I work with. Mm -hmm. Right. There's something almost athletic about it. You have to remain in shape, so to speak, and uh, keep those faculties sharp. So, yeah. Well, I I also, I mean, we were speaking about Verez earlier, and and I wonder about this with respect to him and also Schoenberg, both of whom had lengthy periods of years or even decades of relative inactivity as composers. I mean, it doesn't mean that they weren't still thinking about music and preoccupied with it in other in another sense, but that to me is almost unimaginable uh, to go ten years without writing so much as a, a a line of music. Well, I don't believe they did. I think they were. I think they were still. You see, the, the thing is, if you're planning a composition, you don't have to leave the sketches behind. People do destroy sketches. People throw them away because they're not what they wanted to do. And it's like, when I first got to know Webern's music, people were making a great thing out of the 31 numbered opuses. And they didn't know about the early works. They didn't know about all the other cycles of songs that Webern wrote, sometimes as sketches for the ones that he then published, um, but sometimes numbers of, 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 of songs in a cycle, which was then reduced to five from seven or four from nine or whatever it happened to be. And so later on, all these other works appeared out of nowhere. And also, um, out of circumstances, maybe beyond the composer's control, they had to get employment doing other t- other things, conducting, practicing for concerts. It takes a lot of time, so then you don't have time to compose. Okay, for 10 years is not something I would do, but maybe it is for some people. Mm-hmm. Um, and people do have blocks. Fortunately, I don't very often. Um, but that you depends on your psychology you know if if you're the type that you know immobilizes yourself through some kind of shock or trauma and then you don't compose or like Dukas, you're not satisfied with what you wrote and then you burn everything at the end mm. mm-hmm. um yeah of course then you get a distorted perspective i mean there is a, obviously a a massive project that Varez was working on during that period called Espace, which yes, he never, course, yeah. which he never completed, and so that certainly took up well, an enormous amount of time. Somebody else completed it, hasn't he? Ch- uh, uh, Xu Wenchong has. Uh, yeah, it's been completed. Yeah, it's the it's the case with Ruggles too. There was a massive opera project that he worked on for decades, actually, that uh, he ended up burning. I believe there's there's uh, there's a few sketches that have survived, but. Uh, but it's true, often the, the published output is the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. There are many other things that, for one reason or another, just didn't survive or weren't retained by the composer. So, Well, sometimes disasters happen. I know, I'm, I'm not going to name the composer, but that, no, a fairly well-known one, um, whose family were not especially sympathetic uh, to his work. And so after he died they just simply put it in a slip in the road and it was taken away and destroyed. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. It happens. Well, just as, you know, the soldiers that uh, tramped through Vabrant's house after he died cut out portions of his manuscripts to use for uh, for lining their boots. Yep. You know? Very practical. Indeed. Yeah. So, Michael, what I'd like to do, I, I could certainly go on talking for quite some time because uh, this is completely fascinating, but I'd really like to put a couple of questions to you that were, uh, that were asked by people uh, who are following this podcast. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you would, here's a couple of questions that came in. Mm-hmm. So this is from Theo, and he writes, You've spoken of being inspired by nature, particularly with respect to the density of your voice and layer writing. But aside from this surface image of density, how does nature enter into your work? Does your composition process in some way reflect the organic production of forms found in nature? Or are your pieces closer to oral representations of the image of nature? How do your views on nature and creative production relate, if at all, to your philosophy of transcription? I think it's more 
it's not it's not about reproducing or uh, evoking the sounds of nature it's more um with respect to the image about uh, about complexity or density or whatever intricacy of um natural formations i i walk in the country um and i see things and the visual image becomes a sound image in my mind so uh, it so happens that i'm sure there must be a, a name for this that i'm one of those people who uh, see and hear more or less in the same sort of way um somebody told me about uh, there was a he he was making a film about um ligeti in san francisco and ligeti said that he wasn't so aware of the of the of the of of the fog suddenly descending as he was of a change of sound quality and he was imagining sound you you get to the point i think where you hear more or less everything as a sound image potentially so i mean i'm looking out of my studio window now and i can see two houses and they're slightly irreg they're slightly at irregular angles and they're not like in straight lines like most english streets are um they're sort of like like that to each other and i immediately hear a sound combination which has some of the correspondence to that angularity it, it's it, it, i don't know how it happens and i don't really want to because i'm worried it would disappear if i analyzed it too much but it's 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 not about for example i live by the sea it's 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 i don't reproduce the sound of the sea in pieces because i live near the coast mm. does that mm. answer the question do you think yes yes absolutely yeah it, it's not uh, it's not illustrative in nature that's not uh... no it's not representational mm -hmm. it's, ab mm -hmm. it's abstracted right wonderful okay so bruno wrote in with a question um this will take us into territory that maybe you'd uh, would rather not go over again, but I'm, cu I'm curious about this. Your work has been associated with the new complexity movement, for lack of a better term. In retrospect, how do you feel about that association? And do you see commonalities between the works of other new complexity composers and your own? Well, yes, of course I see commonalities because I know them personally. I, Brian Fernio is three years older than I am. We met when he was in his final year and I was in my first year um, studying in London. Uh, we had a mutual friend called Philip Pilkington who played the piano. We played, Philip and I played through Brian's two piano sonata. And Brian and I got talking. He ran an ensemble at that time, the Aradon Ensemble, I think it was called. Um, and this was before he moved to Europe. And uh, I suppose it was one of those friendships that was based on common musical interests. Uh, we neither of us, I think, are <laughs> deliberately setting out to write complex music. Uh, both of us are complex people. Most creative artists are complex people. Um, but I've never met anybody that wanted to be thought of as being simple. So complex is probably either thought of as the opposite of clear, because a lot of people in music make a fetish of clarity. Um, but then they usually apply the word to Mozart, who was famously told off by some person, a regal person, I think some monarch, um, for writing too many notes. Too many notes, my dear Mozart, he said. And Mozart's music is not at all uncomplex. Listen to the act two finale of Marriage of Figaro. It's very complex. It's, it's very beautifully layered. And like Charles Ives, you can hear every detail or not, depending on what your ears are like. <laughs> 
the other opposition to complex is difficult. Um, this is used by performers a lot. Um, I don't play complex music because it's too difficult. Uh, in other words, it uses up too many man hours. Mm. Um, I prefer to play uh, music with less notes in because I don't have to think too hard. That sort of syndrome. Frankly, I'm not interested in that kind of way of thinking. Uh, there are as many notes as there need to be in the places where they need to be. It's not complex for the sake of being complex. The other thing is I don't only write complex music. I do write for amateurs a lot. I've always mm. done music for theatre with untrained voices. Um, and that interests me a great deal. I don't do it because... It's, it's painful labour um, or forced labour. Um, I do it because I like it. I, I like a lot of variety in my life. Well, I, heard even, piece, I heard a piece you did recently for Eru and Piano, which, which yeah. is a, a lovely piece, but it, it, it doesn't sound uh, uh, complex, perhaps, in the way that some people might expect. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different side of your production, I suppose. I think it is quite complex. I mean, it's quite complex culturally if you consider consider the juxtaposition of a of a Chinese traditional instrument with a grand piano is already quite a complex of aesthetic ideas. And in fact, the Erhu line uh, includes microtones and glissandi and a bounced bow, which is quite unusual, although it's a traditional. Um, uh, a thing which has become less common these days. So it's 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 not without its complexities, uh, but they're not necessarily visual on the surface of the page. Mm -hmm. And um, com complex music tends to be called that because of the amount of information that's on the page, rather than the sound world that results from that information. Right. If more right, people right. would listen to complex music, they'd find that actually it probably wasn't complex at all. It's certainly my pieces are very simple architecturally. They tend to move in big blocks. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of it does have to do with just a very superficial reading of what the what the scores might look like. Um, it isn't as though the Liszt Sonata is a simple piece. You know, <laughs> you can't just whip that off. So. Performers saying that it's too difficult or it's too complex is it's kind of a well, it's kind of a strange uh, justification for not performing the music. If you consider well, some of the things that pianists have to, oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. I, I thank you for this uh, this exchange, which uh, which I really enjoyed, and um, it's uh, it's wonderful to get a chance to talk with you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you too. A bit nerve-wracking, but a pleasure just to say. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you.